Hi, this is Officer Klein with Customs and Border Protection Anchorage, Alaska. Just checking to see where you're at. Uh, we were expecting you uh, three and a half hours ago and just check and see if we need to call out the emergency services or anything. Get this message, give us a call. Thanks, bye. And he was a young boy. Uh, I'm going to say somewhere around five to six, as I recall. I remember he would sit in here and watch television during the whatever Gulf War that was and the fighters taking off from the aircrafts. And Fly safely. Yeah. Right. Make sure you don't, you're not too high. I'd rather have you land halfway down and stop. On his 14th birthday, he was so accomplished a pilot that I had no qualms about it. I mean, he could have soloed months before that. Legally, he couldn't, but, but in terms of skill level, he definitely could. My concern, again, was that no matter where he went, he was going to be surprised by weather. Jack Wiegand is not your typical 20-year-old. It's safe to say the Bullard High grad has loftier goals than most people his age. Starting May 1st, I'm going to attempt to be the youngest person to solo an airplane around the world. Yeah, you heard him right. In a little more than two weeks, Jack is hoping to soar his way into the Guinness Book of World Records. If I'm back before my 21st birthday on June 22nd, then I will have the record when I am 20 years old. With 600 flight hours already under his belt, Jack is a veteran in the cockpit. Jack says his parents are supportive of his record-breaking mission, even if it means he'll spend 40 to 50 days flying around the world by himself. It was one of those times when you think, oh gosh, am I, did I do the right thing? Should I have let him do this? Because anything can happen up there. We were all pretty emotional when he left, just waving goodbye. I'll never forget that. Wiegand takes off from his home in Fresno, May 2nd. His route, 21,000 nautical miles, over 12 countries. He must cross three oceans. Jack makes his first international crossing in Canada. Customs personnel greet him warmly. They know his story. But Wiegand forgets his passport on the copier back home. The oversight gains him international fame when CNN and others run the story. One hundred fifty miles from the Iran-Pakistan border, a plane begins to tail Jack, an unmarked F-18 with unknown intentions. Because Jack's international radio frequency doesn't work, he can't identify himself. His fate is in the hands of the fighter pilot. Eventually, the F-18 peels away. I guess I was as surprised as anyone when that jet intercepted him because I don't know where it came from and I don't think Jack knew where it came from any, either. 20 miles outside of Calcutta, Jack's GPS shows lightning. His fuel is minimal. He must continue. Above the airport, Jack spots a small patch of clear sky within the thunder clouds. He shoots his plane into the opening, throttles back the engine, throws the flaps up, and lowers the landing gear for drag. Jack then makes a series of tight circles within the opening. Slowly, he lowers the plane below the clouds. At the small airport, ground crews watch in disbelief. The Calcutta landing challenges every piloting skill Jack has. But his biggest test is yet to come. Bad weather has grounded him for three weeks in Japan. Now, with a bum radio and a plane that is burning too much fuel, Jack must cross the Pacific to land in the Aleutian Islands at night. The islands have more aviation fatalities than anywhere in America by three times. only time of his trip 
where he was going to be faced with 2,000 miles of open ocean. There are no islands at all between the island of Hokkaido and the Aleutian Islands, which is where he was headed. His frustration level was escalating every day when he couldn't leave, as my fear was what he was getting into. We were always were trying to get somewhere else. And I was a little bit hesitant, but it looked to me like his only chance to go was the fact that the system coming out of the sea at Atasque was slow enough so that it wasn't going to block his route. And then we had this other system coming up from the North, North Pacific that was not going to be getting in his way. No more than 10 seconds after I took off, I was over water. And that was kind of where I was going to be living for the next 12 hours. And probably more than 30 minutes into the flight, he, he talked to me on the telephone and said he was running into to snow and some icing, and it looked like he was running into weather. And at that point in time, it sounded like he wanted to turn around and come back. But I'm looking at the weather screen on my computer, and I'm saying to him, Jack, I think you should go with it, stay with it, stay on that, that heading you've got, and I think you'll get through it. I'm more than halfway. This is the Kamchatka Peninsula. You go west here. This is Japan where I came from. And I am crossing over the middle of nowhere right now in the ocean. It was a situation where he had just enough time to get between them. And because the two systems were rotating opposite one another, they provided a huge tailwind through this very narrow channel um, between the two systems, enough for him to launch himself through there. I really went right in between two very large storm systems, you know. Had I gone through any one of those storm systems, it could have been a much worse outcome. Without a tailwind, he would have been forced to land through the fog in Attu, and that would have been really, really dangerous. I knew that, okay, because I had these tailwinds, that allowed me to go further, I have to take advantage of it, and I have to go on to Dutch Harbor. Uh, so I took another three hours and, and, and was able to make it to Dutch Harbor. I got to Dutch Harbor with, you know, only about 14 gallons of fuel left in the tank. You know, the plane holds 130, you talk about only having 14 gallons left, that's not very much. 14 gallons of fuel probably would have lasted me around an hour, but an hour to go where, you know? Dutch Harbor was the only airport within a few hundred miles that had av gas, the kind of gas that I needed. To me, that was the, by far the scariest part of the entire flight. You know, 58 or 59 days later, it was, you know, it's kind of just backing up in my mind, you know, yes, having bad weather to land in St. Louis, he told me the passport issue, uh, you know, the issues he had in India that he touched on a little bit. Uh, being intersected by the fighter F-18 or 15, whatever it was, over the, over the uh, Gulf was, uh, you know, he's going to make it. He's going to get this done. During the entire flight, uh, I would always kind of envision what it would be like to come back to Fresno. I'm about 15 minutes outside of Fresno. Feels good to be back in the valley. Feels good to be getting close to home. I'll turn the video back on when I uh, when I land. Check it out. I turn in, I see two fire trucks, uh, and I knew exactly what that was for right when I saw them. But I thought, wow, this is you know such an honor to have this happen. So I was just ecstatic to be back, you know, ecstatic to see everyone. Um, so happy to, to to just kind of be home again. It was definitely worth it, but it was only worth it because I was successful with it. It was worth it because it's done, and I don't have to do it every single day. Uh, but would I do it again? Probably not. No time soon, at least.